So let's start by defining our terms. Uh, what are we talking about when we talk about natural resources and natural resource uh, rents? Uh, I started with a photo of what was until 2016 or 2017 uh, the largest open pit mine in Australia, the Kalgoorlie uh, gold mine out in Western Australia. I think it was uh, surpassed by another one in Western Australia. But if you just, it's hard to kind of wrap your head around the size and scale of the industrial uh, extraction of minerals from the ground that Australia um, has and that other countries uh, around the world has as well. Um, um, a lot fewer people have to work on these si kind of industrial resource extraction projects in Australia than you will see in uh, other countries, uh, often because of the capital that can be expended on these kind of huge uh, earth moving uh, equipment. So let's start by defining our terms and connect it to the resources that we're going to be looking at uh, for the rest of this week. So when we kind of uh, define resources, uh, there's two kind of basic types, uh, extractive and produced. Uh, extractive uh, resources are minerals like gold or silver, copper, coltan, things that we, uh, coal, things that we take out of the ground while uh, produced resources are ones that, um, that human beings can make, like uh, wheat, corn, um, uh, rice, uh, soybeans, uh, the things that we talked about uh, last week. So that's a basic kind of differentiation, ones uh, that we extract from the ground versus the ones that we produce by effort and resources that we put into the ground. Um, also, different resources have different salient qualities for the types of research questions that we talk about um, when we talk about natural resources, the resource curse and um, development and, and conflict. Uh, is it how much of the resource is produced, what the quality uh, or quantity of the, of the resource, how much it's worth um, when it gets on board a ship to sail uh, to other countries? Um, is there a difference between how much the resource is worth when you uh, have it ref uh, in its raw form or whether it's refined, um, or is it the money that people or corporations or governments can earn in rents from the production of these resources. So when we're talking about natural resources and conflict, we have to be specific about what aspect of that resource production um, is relevant. Uh, we're gonna define um, resource rents in, in, in a second. Um, the other salient uh, quality is how we normalize the values of these natural resource uh, rents or production um, to kind of see the size and scale in a meaningful way. Kind of like with uh, gross domestic product. Do you care about the total amount or the per capita amount? Uh, the How much uh, an economy produces over the amount of people within um, the country. Um, so do you when you're talking about natural resources, is it relevant for just the amount of money that it generates or given this, this size of the, uh, the economy in which it's being produced? Also, um, some resources are consumed domestically. A lot are actually uh, exported. So if a resource like oil is 90% of exports, is that what really matters or is it 90% of overall total economic uh, production uh, that matters? Or is it just like we talked about taxable uh, revenue and state capacity in previous weeks? Um, is it these resource rents or taxes as a percent of total government re uh, revenue that's really uh, important? So we, we have to usually normalize instead of using the absolute uh, volume of money produced or, or, or goods produced, right? It's um, how important is it to the country or the people within the country that we're, we're talking about. There's a lot of different natural resources uh, that people have looked at. The obvious ones would be um, the fuel minerals like oil uh, and natural gas, other minerals, gold, coltan, uh, cobalt, coltan goes into making uh, cell phones, uh, same uh, with gold, uh, tantalum, uh, gemstones, diamonds, uh, emeralds, rubies, all those kind of good things. Um, different resources 
are located in um, different parts of the world. Uh, we still don't have a complete picture of where everything is. As with the Afghan case, new discoveries are still being made and technological innovations are um, occurring on a day-to-day -day and yearly basis that allow um, corporations and governments to access resources where they weren't possible before with deep sea oil uh, exploration uh, or with uh, geological exploration under the ground um, and new techniques for being able to, like with uh, fracking, uh, completely transformed the oil um, uh, market in the United States. When I was living in upstate New York during graduate school, um, side note, um, there were a lot of meetings in the one, I, I went to grad school in uh, SUNY Binghamton. It was a small um, college town, post-industrial town uh, in, in uh, upstate New York, about three hours away from New York City. It really became uh, an industrial powerhouse in the early um, uh, 20th century with uh, shoe production, um, experimentation in uh, corporate welfare, creating the, the big um, uh, shoe company, um, created these villages uh, for their workers to live, provided resources for them. Um, all that kind of moved abroad, and now um, the university uh, there is one of the, the largest economic uh, producers uh, there. The one hotel, the Hilton in town, when I was there, had a couple of meetings of oil um, companies and uh, farmers and other people that owned land in the area because this was when fracking was really uh, taking off in the United States. Some places it still wasn't legal, but there was um, licenses for exploration. People who didn't have resources before ended up gra um, getting a chunk of money up front and the promise of more down later if they went uh, to the Hilton in uh, Binghamton and uh, reached agreements with people to allow for exploration rights ended up uh, transforming not just parts of upstate New York and Pennsylvania, but other parts of the United States as well. Um, so where the resources are is an accident of geology. The, the resources that people have to try to get it out of the ground, the legal and economic structures that are necessary for corporations to take the risk to invest um, is something that uh, fluctuates and changes over time. This, as a side note, this picture of the Blue Nile uh, diamond was the most expensive diamond that I could find that you can buy online. I don't know if you would spend over 200,000 uh, US dollars on a diamond, um, but it's amazing what you can, and you can buy gold too if you uh, are worried about the end of the world to stock up on resources. So resource rents, what are resource rents? They are the profits above and beyond production costs. Um, where the costs include a normal rate of return on the capital invested. So resource rents um, can flow either to private corporations and individuals uh, or through taxation or um, lease agreements or agreements with the government can flow directly to the government. We're going to look at how these profits above and beyond costs, including uh, a reasonable amount of profit, can have dramatic effects on the stability of political systems, the corruption and the imminent individual wealth that can um, uh, accrue to certain people who control uh, the resources and how this can have um, quite dramatic effects. Um, the rentier effects of these kind of resource uh, production um, are uh, the effects that these resource rents have on the political system. I used to live in uh, Alaska for a couple of years, and if you live for more, I, don't, I think this is still the case, if you lived in Alaska for more than nine months a year, um, you would get cut a check uh, from the government uh, for, actually, I think it flows through the government, but it's actually from the oil production in uh, the North Slope up in Barrow and other parts uh, of Alaska. Part of the agreements that the um, oil uh, companies uh, made with the state was that part of the profits every year would flow to the people of uh, Alaska. And so this allowed Alaska to avoid having to have a, um, a personal uh, inc a state income tax, uh, reduce the amount of uh, other taxes, 
uh, within the state, um, and it allows for provision of public goods, spending on infrastructure, uh, education, uh, um, and then here for private patronage uh, as well, but you often see that in, um, in other states that these rentier effects allow the revenue, the governments to reduce taxes, increase public goods, increase pa uh, patronage, um, and it also can reduce the government's dependency on the people um, to, to govern and their, their taxes. Because if you have resource rents, you don't need to depend on uh, people uh, and their um, acquiescence to being ruled. You can get the revenues that you need uh, to buy the tools to either provide public goods or prevent people from feeling like they have a, a, a chance at uh, violently opposing the government. Um, but as we've seen with the Venezuelan case um, a couple of months ago now, that if you depend on one particular resource and these revenues, when the good times are good, right, like when Hugo Chavez was um, giving money to people who didn't have enough money to um, heat their homes in the no in Northeast in the U.S., uh, they he was able to help his own country develop and help people outside the country. However, when oil prices decline or production uh, becomes an issue, this makes um, governments much more sensitive to international uh, prices and uh, risk. And so that's why diversifying an economy is, is seen as a way to deal with rentier effects, that when the good times are good, um, everything's great, but if um, good times go bad, like with the pandemic, oil prices, the um, uh, oil futures back in the early uh, few months of the pandemic actually reached negative values as the futures contracts were just about to end. People who are betting about the prices of oil can bet on future oil um, uh, purchases, but no one actually wants to actually buy the oil. And so when the contracts are almost up, when people who have to uh, take the oil at the end of the contract, um, the prices briefly went negative because people didn't actually have the storage capacity or didn't want to uh, have the oil. Now oil prices have stabilized a bit, but it's still um, a half or to a third of what it was a couple of years earlier. So that's why diversifying can reduce the risk of political instability or indeed authoritarian collapse. Um, and diversifying, you can diversify uh, with different types of um, uh, minerals. If you have, uh, pr if you produce a couple of different ones, commodity prices, as we're gonna see, often do uh, go up and down in rough, um, in rough uh, correlative, uh, correlative relationship, uh, but they don't always. And so one of the readings for today, the uh, fails and we looked at five different resources and how they can have different effects. Um, and they, they looked at how the more diverse um, your resource base is, the less likely you're going to have authoritarian collapse. Although the question that I had for the paper is, does that include civil conflict, right, in that kind of authoritarian collapse? So what natural resources are, the, what really matters often can be the money that you can get from it, right, the resource rents, um, but that the risks that come along with those rents uh, lead to rentier effects that could increase um, instability um, and uh, the possibility of, of um, uh, civil conflict. And I think it's really interesting studying this in such a resource-rich uh, country. Uh, like Australia, we're considered uh, the lucky country, the natural resource base that we have here. Uh, mining might have decreased in importance relatively in the last couple of years, um, but we still are a significant exporter of natural resources, um, and uh, uh, including uh, coal, iron, copper, gold, right? Um, and the second paragraph from the CIA Factbook uh, excerpt here, um, uh, for two decades up until 2017, Australia had benefited from a dramatic surge in terms of uh, trade. Export prices increased faster than import prices, uh, which means that the, th the money you get from sending things abroad is greater than the, the prices we have to pay for things coming in, uh, which led to great terms of trade. Um, the economy experienced continuous growth up until the uh, pandemic, very low public date, uh, debt contained uh, inflation, um, although our, our 
resource base, as we're going to see, is quite dependent on uh, international prices for these commodities, changing preferences uh, for certain resources, right? Um, China has promised to, to turn carbon neutral by 20, uh, 2060. I think India is still uh, building coal-fired power plants. China is still building some coal-fired power plants. Uh, but there's a worry that with um, a dependence on a resource or a few resources, um, if one country buys a lot of them, um, then the political tensions that we're having uh, with China can end up having economic effects as well as uh, on the government's uh, bottom line. So contrast this uh, um, CIA factbook description um, with the one in uh, South Sudan, which is our case study that we're going to look at in a second. This is a breakdown. I like um, visual representations for how important different market segments are, uh, and this is why I really like this, um, these visualizations from the Observatory of Economic Complexity. Uh, this is um, the uh, Australian export um, market. You see that while um, uh, Australia was one of the top 10 producers of wheat in the world. As we saw last week, it still only represents a little over 1% of uh, export of the $248 billion uh, that we export every year. Coal is still the largest export that we have with 23%, iron 19%, uh, gas 7%, uh, gold 6.5%. You can go to the website and see what those really tiny boxes are, uh, but you see um, that uh, well over 40% of our export market is to natural resources. And the destination, um, by far the largest destination, is China with 35, uh, almost 36% with other countries in our region like Japan, South Korea, and India making up the other large um, destination countries. And what's really, I think, interesting for me as an Australian American is the fact that the United States, um, the world's largest economy for now, I believe, um, that we only uh, export less than 4% of Australian resources to the United States and what effect that might have on security, cultural or historical foreign policy relations with the United States when you see the fact that there's almost 10 times more exports going to the Chinese market than the United States market. What effect that might have on um, tools of, of foreign policy power is something that that I'm sure you've probably covered in your other courses if you're an international relations student, uh, but is one I think is definitely relevant when you think about natural resources and conflict. Because I think this topic, natural resources and conflict, the conflicts that arise or are related to natural resources are some of the most internationalized because of the importance that resources play in the security of um, a lot of countries around the world, as well as the corporations that produce them, how important those corporations are for economic and political uh, political support in their home countries also make any kind of instability or interruptions in supply incredibly important for foreign policy. So yeah, let's compare the the Australian case to the South Sudanese case, right? You still see quite large um, individual sectors or destination states, um, but it's still nothing compared to the world's newest country. South Sudan became independent in 2011. We're going to be talking about it um, later on uh, today. But you see a country uh, and its economy that's basically wholly determined by the export of one resource, which is oil, and one resource going to one market, which is uh, China. This uh, I've been studying the Sudanese case since 2005 or, or something, and it really is a fascinating example of a country, it used to be one country um, until 2011. Oil production occurred mostly in the south. Um, this is where the, the, there was ethnic and linguistic differences between the north and the south, a uh, number of different rebel groups um, in the south and the east and in the west in Darfur. Um, and the Sudanese government also depended uh, and depends quite heavily on resource extraction from the south. South Sudan is landlocked and so has to depend on the pipelines going through Sudan. Um, but also due to the Sudanese uh, conflict 
and the human rights record of the Sudanese regime, international um, oil producing uh, corporations from democracies like uh, Talisman was a case I looked at specifically, Canadian um, uh, resource company was basically named and shamed to the point where they had to stop doing business in Sudan because of the um, human rights record of the Sudanese uh, government and other demo uh, democratic states oil companies also found it not practical to, to be there. So China, India, Malaysia, other countries, um, oil corporations, often state-owned, came in and have filled the gap. And now in 2018, you see South Sudan's oil basically exclusively going to, um, uh, to China. So you have this complete dependence on one resource and a complete dependence on one destination that dwarfs anything that Australia or other more diversified economies uh, have to deal with. And so we're going to see how that creates problems and some rentier effects in South Sudan uh, a bit later on. So this is the CIA factbook um, paragraph for South Sudan. I'm not going to um, read it. Well, so while they do have 10 to 20 million head of cattle, um, it is the most uh, one of the most oil-dependent oil countries in the world, um, and it runs uh, to uh, the Red Sea on the coast. And so you have this dependence on a resource that can go from uh, U.S. Uh, over $120 a barrel to down to $25 a barrel to now I think it's in the 40 U.S. dollars uh, per barrel. And so that effect that it has on governor government revenues uh, also raises, it can double, triple, or it can have uh, within the space of a couple months, as we're going to see uh, in a second. Okay, so the resource curse. We've talked about what natural resources are. We talked about uh, rentier uh, effects. What is the actual natural resource curse? Um, taking this from the Michael Ross uh, article, um, the adverse effects of a country's natural resource wealth on its economic, social, or political well-being. Um, so you have wealth that ends up being uh, having negative effects on economic, social, or political outcomes. Um, this can rise also from Dutch disease, um, which is a uh, comes from the experience uh, that the Netherlands had, where you had. Um, people, uh, one industry soaking up a lot of the, um, the labor to be able to produce a highly valuable natural resource, uh, as well as inflation of the currency because of the sheer volume of exports of a particular natural resource. So resource curse leading to negative uh, outcomes. Just look at the this uh, index of primary commodity prices, depending a couple of different ways of operationalizing it, but just looking at the economic, uh, the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, you had a high point, an index of over 200, and it went, it decreased 50% within a year to below 100. And so you have companies, uh, countries like uh, Venezuela, uh, South Sudan, that are dependent on these kind of uh, commodities and the prices that you can get for them on the global um, market, and the government resources uh, that. Uh, come from that can have in a relatively short period of time. You can also see in 2020, uh, not a quite as dramatic uh, drop, but you also saw quite a dramatic drop starting in uh, March or so of 2020. As people stopped moving around, they started uh, not needing uh, as much uh, oil uh, to drive to work or to go on the plane flights and things like that. So when you depend on a highly concentrated economy, for your government's resources, it also means that you depend on the global markets for um, uh, for resources. And so that that was an aggregate um, price fluctuation over time. Just looking at Brent crude, um, the UK along with Norway are probably case examples of how you can have a lot of money from resources. Um, quite quickly, but still in a diversified economy, try to put money aside and invest it. The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, has gotten huge and has a lot of market power because of the resources from oil, but and the it also has helped diversify the country away from a dependence on one resource price. You saw that dramatic decline is even more dramatic when you just look at oil prices as opposed to commodity prices. Um, also decrease in 2015, 2016, which helped start 
um, the challenges in Venezuela and also that uh, decline in um, in uh, in 2020 because of the uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. So. That is kind of a brief overview of the major terms that we're going to be talking about for today. Um, and I think trying to link the topic to other things that we've seen so far in this class, um, focused on productive resources last week, uh, extractive resources that we're going to focus on this week. Um, do, you really th do you really find, and this week's uh, literature specifically kind of devalues, uh, except for the, the Humphreys article, um, um, do you buy the argument that extractive resources are inherently more um, destabilizing than produced resources? Um, do you buy that argument? Why? Um, take uh, a bit of a time, go to Waddle and answer the question, uh, ponder on it, and then we'll go ahead and move on uh, to our next section. <laughs>